Um, my name's Farsai, and I'm the Vice President of Columbia's Undergraduate Entrepreneurship Organization. On behalf of CORE, I'm very excited to welcome all of you to this evening's conversation with Jack Dorsey. I'd like to start the evening off by thanking Columbia's Center for Career Education, the Columbia Alumni Association, Columbia Entrepreneurship, the Columbia Entrepreneurship Organization, Public Safety, and everyone at University Event Management for their support in helping us make Jack's visit to campus a reality. At CORE, our mission is to empower the student body to become entrepreneurs and to support those who decide to make this leap. In fact, our conversation with Jack and the trade show later this evening kick off CORE's Startup Week. Tomorrow night, we launch Coding with CORE and ADI, a weekly event aimed at teaching basic technical and prototyping skills. On Wednesday, we're hosting at our town hall, a monthly meeting designed to feature Columbia alumni and give the current community, you guys, a forum to give and receive feedback on all the amazing ideas that are coming out of campus. On Thursday, we have a business lab internship panel where companies will be sharing internship opportunities in the startup world. And finally, to cap things off, we're hosting a core mixer on Friday to connect those interested in entrepreneurship with each other and with the entrepreneurship community here at Columbia. We hope we'll see you at a few of these coming events. If you're interested in keeping in touch, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at coreboard.columbia.edu. Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing Dean Boyce, an extremely well-received member of our Columbia community. Once upon a time, Dean Boyce served on the faculty of MIT, holding positions and winning awards there for over 25 years, eventually leading their mechanical engineering department from 2009 to 2013. After we stole her away from MIT to do great things here as Columbia's engineering dean, she's been an enthusiastic supporter of innovation and entrepreneurship initiatives, including the minor in entrepreneurship at SEAS, the National Science Foundation's Innovation Corps, and Columbia Entrepreneurship Nights, where she most recently moderated a panel discussion on the future of money at the Computer History Museum in California. Recognized as a preeminent scholar, popular in the classroom, and well-known for collaborative work and leadership, Dean Boyce spent her undergraduate years at Virginia Tech and earned her master's and PhD in mechanical engineering from MIT. Basically, she's pretty awesome. So um, please join me now in welcoming Dean Boyce to the stage. Thank you, Farsay. And thank you all for coming tonight to hear Jack Dorsey, a transformational entrepreneur and our keynote speaker, and also to later visit aspiring Columbia entrepreneurs during the Columbia Founders Trade Show. Since joining Columbia in July, I have been impressed with not only the amazing talent of the faculty and students of Columbia, but also the enthusiasm and the engagement of faculty, graduate students, undergraduate students, and alumni in entrepreneurship. At Columbia, we are also fortunate to be living and breathing the culture and the spirit of the city of New York, a city which has embraced the power and potential of entrepreneurship in shaping our future. We see the spirit and culture across the university in the hundreds of research laboratories, in every school, and in every dorm. And we strive to nurture the creative and innovative and entrepreneurial attitude at all levels. The Center for Career Education supports students and student groups working in the entrepreneurial space. Our trustees have established Columbia Entrepreneurship, a university-wide effort that aims to increase support for all Columbia entrepreneurs led by University Trustee Emeritus Richard Witten, a special advisor to the president specifically for entrepreneurship. We see this culture as well in the opportunities available to student entrepreneurs. Our annual Pitch Fest will take place on October 30th, NYC Next Idea, a new venture competition in the spring that Columbia Engineer engineering hosts in collaboration with the city, is open to participants from colleges and universities around the world. Winners receive the diverse range of support needed to succeed, whether mentoring, space, funds, visibility, or other resources, so they can launch their startups here in the city. Soon, Columbia Engineering will open the university's second shared startup space 
incubator downtown on Varick Street in partnership with our business school. And our entrepreneurial community includes tremendously proactive student groups that support our student entrepreneurs. I'm especially proud that two student groups, CORE, the Columbia Organization of Rising Entrepreneurs, and the CEO, the Columbia Entrepreneurship Organization, are our hosts this evening. And I congratulate both groups for their leadership in organizing tonight's event. Our keynote speaker tonight, Jack Dorsey, embodies the enthusiastic pursuit of innovation and entrepreneurship that we strive to nurture here at Columbia. Jack is known to us all for his remarkable abilities as a truly disruptive innovator, one whose ideas and creative new technologies literally change the way many of us do or will experience our everyday lives, opening up new avenues of communication and commerce across the world as creator and co-founder of Twitter and as founder and CEO of Square. At the launching of Twitter, who would have thought that a simplified 140 character broadcasting capability would be so widely adopted? And who could have envisioned the impact on people communicating across the globe? Such impact was not anticipated during creation or even during launch of the new technology, but only became clear as people use such breakthrough technologies in creative new ways, all due to the innovation to make this new technology simple for the user. Square has similarly opened up exciting new avenues for commerce, making it simple, easy, and cost efficient for anyone to accept credit cards on their smartphones or tablets, opening up new commerce streams and markets for small scale and or emerging new businesses, while also making purchasing simpler for the consumer. It's exciting to witness and experience the launch and rapid adoption of new and transformative technologies that have such a positive influence on our lives and on lives across the globe. I'm thrilled that we're able to hear today from such a leading entrepreneur in this space, Jack Dorsey. In 2008, MIT Technology Review named Jack as one of the TR35. This is one of the top 35 innovators in the world under the age of 35. Jack has also been honored as Innovator of the Year Award by the Wall Street Journal, and he has been recognized as one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time Magazine. Please join me in welcoming Jack Dorsey. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, everyone ready? Great. Um, we're, uh, we're thrilled to be here, um, honored to be here, and I want to um, do something very simple which is just talk about uh, a lot of left turns that I took uh, to get to the place where I am today. And also give you, hopefully, two tools that you can use on a daily basis um, at, the, at the very end. We also have another agenda, which is we want to hire all of you. Not all of you, but some of you. Um, we're looking for people to join our mission, so we'd love to talk to you. Um, but to start, I want to talk about how things began and how things began for me and how I've, I found meaning in all the random sorts of departures and meanderings I've had to make through, through my life. So of course it all started, as everyone does, with uh, our parents. These are my parents. My parents have a great story. Uh, my father, when he was 19 years old, uh, decided that he wanted to create and start a pizza restaurant. Why? Because he loved making pizza. He had a best friend named Ron, and the two best friends got together, and they said, let's create a restaurant and they, so we could bake pizza every single day, and that's our job. That's all we have to do in the world. And, uh, and the pizza restaurant started doing really well. They love making pizza. My father's uh, pizza was an all-meat pizza. I don't think it had sauce or cheese on it. It's called the Tim's, the Tim's Special. And the company started doing so well that they needed help. They needed to hire people. And they wanted to preserve um, their friendship, but they also wanted to preserve the business. So they made one rule between the two best friends, 
which is they would not date the wait staff. And the first person they hired was my mother. <laughs> and my father immediately fell in love with my mother, Marcia. And it took a little bit of time, but eventually he went to his best friend and said, look, I, uh, I broke the rule. I'm going to have to leave. The business is yours. And I was born 10 months after that. Um, so a great entrepreneurship founding story. Uh, and definitely had a big impact on me. But when I was a kid, when I was growing up, I really wanted to see the world. I wanted to be a sailor. And I come from St. Louis, Missouri. And there's no oceans in St. Louis, Missouri. But there are lakes. And there is a river that connects to the ocean. And I wanted to see everything the world had to offer. So I got really into sailing and just visualizing what uh, the world might be out there. And it really, it really drove me. And it wasn't just through the physical things and, and you know, the, the physical manifestation of the world, but it was also through the conceptual. I really wanted to be an artist. I wanted to create something. I wanted to show the world a new way to see itself. Um, and I was really fascinated by the surrealist, um, specifically because they just had all these crazy, wacky ideas. But they really changed perspective of how people saw the world. Uh, and I wanted to do something very, very similar to that. I fell in love immediately due to my parents, due to their love for the city. And I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri. It's a city that's been through a lot of hard times. Most of the population of St. Louis moved out of it uh, in the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s. And the metropolitan area of St. Louis has over 4 million people. The city itself has less than 350,000 people. The downtown was deteriorated. All the big companies left, all the jobs left. But my parents always stuck to it, and they loved it. And I had a fascination with it uh, due to them as well. This, of course, is, is New York. Um, and New York is a, a city that I always wanted to go to. I had dreams about all day long. My parents would never take me. Um, so I would live uh, vicariously through maps. Um, I developed this obsession with maps. And what I loved about maps is I could view them and I could wonder um, street by street or point by point what was happening in this particular intersection. What's going on over here? Uh, what, are we, you know, what, what are we seeing over, the, over there? And I just covered my bedroom walls with maps. Um, this was my favorite thing to read. And obviously, that's very, very odd. But it was, it was something that was meaningful to me and something that I could really lose myself in uh, and, and really uh, and really daydream about. And that was important to me in that spirit of seeing the world and also wanting to be an artist. My parents got a, uh, a Macintosh when, when I was eight years old. Obviously, I'm not eight years old right here. Uh, but they got a Macintosh when I was eight. And uh, this was 1984 when the Mac first came out. And I was blown away by it. Just because you could change it. You could alter it. You could program it. And I resolved to program. I resolved to learn how to draw my obsession, how to draw my maps on this computer so I could play with them and so I could see things happen in real time. Uh, and it's something that really, really obsessed me uh, until I could figure out how to actually do it. And it took some years, but I eventually figured it out. Along the way, my mother opened up a coffee store. Obviously, this is not her coffee store, but I became the first barista. And I was 14 years old, and I was asked to, not asked, but told to be a barista by my mother. And I said, Mom, two things. First, I hate coffee. I can't stand the taste of it, and I don't want to be around it. And second, I have no idea how to make cappuccinos or espresso. She said, I don't care. Get behind the counter. And I became a, uh, a barista for the Shenandoah Coffee Company in St. Louis, Missouri. And I remember my first customer came up and said, I would love a cappuccino. And I said, OK, I'll get right on that. And of course, like, you know, I'm putting the coffee and everything's flying around. The steam is squirting everywhere. I'm just making a complete mess. I hand it over to him. He very slowly sips it. And he said, this is the best cappuccino I've ever had. <laughs> and I said, thank you. That's the first one I actually made. Um, it was fortunate that St. Louis uh, did not have a lot of quality cappuccino back in that day. So <laughs> the bar was very low for me to do something mild and moderate. Um, next came a complete left turn. I was fascinated as a kid 
with learning how cities work, because I love the city so much. And again, going back to those maps, what's actually happening behind all these streets and all these intersections? And St. Louis is very interesting because it has this huge network of caves, natural caves. And the reason that Budweiser and Lemp moved to St. Louis is because all these caves exist underneath the city. And they would cut out ice from the Mississippi River and then put them in the caves, and they would have free, re free refrigeration for their beer. It was brilliant. But not only did they put their beer down in the caves, they also built ballrooms in the caves and dining rooms and all these, entertain all these entertaining places. And this was back in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And I was just fascinated by this. So I had to figure out how to get into these caves. And one of the ways I found is there's this little mansion little mansion uh, in St. Louis, Missouri, called the Ch Chateau Demino Mansion. And I was 15 at this point. And the Chateau Mansion was interesting because it sat on top of the entrance to the most uh, extensive network of caves in the city. And it was a museum. And you could take tours of the museum. So I went and went by myself as a 15-year-old and took a tour of this uh, ridiculous mansion that you know kind of shut down in the uh, in the forties, and the tour guide was was eighty years old, and she told me all about you know how women used to wear ma wax makeup and uh, how you would have to you know, hide the ankles so they would take off their shoes in a very specific way, and how the oppressive heat in St. Louis uh, would make everything terrible, and how they lived through that. And I kept raising my hand, when do we get to go to the cave? Um, she said, what cave? I said, the cave. Or she said, we don't take tours of that. I said, have you seen the cave? And she said, yes. So the next week, I decided that I would take a job here. And I would become <laughs> a tour guide of the Demino Mansion. So it's not actually a job, because I found out she was a volunteer. So this is what's called a docent. So I became a docent. And I was the only person under 70 to <laughs> tour this house. So I would give two-hour tours of this mansion and how people lived back in, at the turn of the century just in order to see the caves. I realized that um, she lied to me. The caves were actually bolted up. They weren't going to open them. But next door was a restaurant called the Lemp Mansion, which is the house of uh, the Lemp family who created uh, the Lemp Brewery. And two things happened. Uh, there were two big brewers in St. Louis at the time, Anheuser-Busch and Lemp. And then Prohibition happened. Anheuser-Busch decided to get into pretzels and soft drinks. And the Lemps decided to kill themselves. So this house right next door was a haunted mansion that served fried chicken. So it also had access to the caves. And they were actually open. And they were haunted. This was fascinating to me. So I quickly changed from becoming a docent to a busboy. So I became a busboy. I was busing out fried chicken. And I finally got a chance to see the caves. And unfortunately, it only went the width of the house. So it was completely meaningless. So during that time, I also got into a, a musical movement uh, called punk. And punk taught me a lot about myself and also the world. Uh, and I looked a little bit like this. And uh, punk was always interesting to me because there was this, uh, there was this desire to practice and to, to build yourself on the world stage. So it wasn't musicians who were trained at classical institutions, but it was actually people who would pick up a guitar, go out to the street, and start playing. And people would boo them. They would go onto a stage and start playing, and people would boo them. But little by little, they actually got better in public. And they learned about what worked and what didn't in public. And I thought that attitude was so awesome and stunning. And I saw more and more of it in my computing life because I got better and better at programming. And one of the ways I got better was actually downloading open source software. People who weren't classically trained as programmers or engineers, but wanted to do it and wanted to do it in public and also share the results of that learning. So I saw a lot of the parallels between punk rock and how people got out there and just did it and had the confidence to make it better and better and better, and also 
open source programming and how someone like Linus Torvalds, who created Linux, got out there, didn't know anything about writing an operating system, put his ideas out there, put his work out there. People were inspired to join and make it better and better and better. And that's been a huge common theme of, of my life and what's worked uh, in, in my success. Um, from punk rock, you have the natural jump to Kevin Bacon and Quicksilver, and specifically bike messengers. Um, so one of the things that my parents had when I was a kid and when I was programming my maps was a CB radio and a police scanner. And from these, I would listen to where an ambulance was going. And an ambulance, when it calls out on the radio, it says, I'm at Fifth and Broadway. I'm going to St. John's Mercy. I have a patient in cardiac arrest. This is where I am. This is where I'm going. And this is what I'm doing. Right? Very, very simple concept. You find the same thing with police. You find the same thing with black cars, with taxis, and with bicycle couriers. These guys are just much, much cooler and much tougher. So um, I wanted to build a system so that I could put my little brother Danny on a bike in St. Louis, Missouri, and he could go and deliver around St. Louis, and I would write the software, the dispatch software for it, so I could track him going through the city. And I wrote the software, and I started building this thing. And uh, Dan got a bike, and on our first day, we realized very quickly that no one in St. Louis needs bike delivery. And um, Dan wasn't that interested in doing it anyway. Uh, so I continued to search. I continued to uh, wonder. And I eventually found one of the biggest dispatch firms in the world right here in New York. And I moved to New York. I dropped out of the University of Missouri Rolla, which is I was going to for computer science. And I enrolled in NYU. And I worked at the biggest dispatch firm in the world that routed all the guys like, like this, Kevin Bacon in this movie, Quicksilver, but also taxis and 911. And suddenly, I had this extreme view of everything that was happening in the city in real time. I could see taxis swarm to the Met. I could see packages being delivered in real time. I could see the police cars. I could see the fire trucks. I could see the ambulances. But I was, I was missing one major aspect, which were the people. Where are the people? What are they doing? Where are they going? And, and that is the idea that really helped formulate a lot of my thinking around, around Twitter. But it wasn't time for it just yet. So I continue to explore how art and technology intersected. And one of the things I was really fascinated by was plants. And I found one of the best botanical illustrators in the world. They just happened to be in St. Louis, Missouri. I moved back from St. Louis and took botanical illustration and started drawing uh, ferns and ginkgo leaves and um, all these flowers. And uh, I realized that this was actually a, a career, and I could make a career out of this, and I can actually do this full time. And I've always had this kind of conflict with engineering and with programming because it's so abstract and so much in your head, and you really want to get back to doing something very, very tangible with your hands. And this actually answered that for me. But what I found in botanical illustration is it's not just about art. It's this precision. So it has both the balance of doing some, drawing something that's beautiful, but also making sure that it lasts, something that scientists can use to catalog where the flora and the fauna are coming from and where, where they go. Um, botanical illustration still exists as a career, but it's very small. And it exists as a career because our eyes can take multiple points of focus, and cameras can only take one. So uh, if you have any desire to become an illustrator, this is a great job. Uh, pays very highly, but unfortunately, it's only in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, so I went back to programming. And I did a lot of contract programming. I did a lot with medical devices. And my wrists started hurting a lot. And one of my friends suggested that I should go see a massage therapist. And I thought that was a great idea. But I'm not someone who just goes to see the massage therapist. I tend to want to learn everything about how massage therapy works. And I got one massage, and it helped in a, in a small way. And then I said, well, <clears throat> I could probably just do this myself. So I'm just going into massage therapy school. And 
I was in St. Louis at the time, and I signed up for a thousand hour course to become a massage therapist. And this is probably one of the most ridiculous times in my life. Because I decided that I would move back to San Francisco, and I would stay a massage therapist, and, but I would do something very, very unique. And this was truly unique. I would do chair massage just for programmers. And while I was massaging their shoulders and their wrist and, and everything that ails people that sit behind computers all the time, I would also talk to them about their code. So I'd give them code therapy and massage therapy. <laughs> and this was in my own head. I really didn't tell anyone. Once I told someone, they said, that is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> that is never going to fly. And I said, well, you know, maybe it will, and I'm going to go out and see. And I went to San Francisco, and I realized that everyone was a massage therapist, and I just didn't want to compete with that. So I went back to technology. And I, uh, I've done a lot of uh, back-end systems. I've written a lot of uh, systems that a lot of people don't see on the forefront. And I wanted to change that. You know, I wanted something that my mom could actually see right in front of her instead of indirectly. So my mom took cabs in New York. My mom got packages delivered uh, from my software, but that was all very indirect. What could I do to actually be direct? So I joined a company called Odeo, which was a podcasting company. And I could care less about podcasting. I didn't like it at all. Um, I didn't listen to any of them. No offense if anyone is a podcaster. But what was amazing to me about Odeo was the team. I really liked the people in it. I loved what they were doing. I loved uh, their, their style, their taste, um, how they express themselves uh, in, in their site and also uh, in everything they're doing. So I wrote a very simple resume, which uh, was my first resume. And it said Jack, period, life, work, and play. And it just listed a bunch of things. I'd never written a, a resume before, but it was enough to catch uh, Evan Williams and Noah Glass's attention. So I actually came in for a conversation. And they tried to convince me that podcasting was actually very, very similar to Dispatch. And I should just see it as the same thing and join the company. And I didn't believe them, of course, but I really loved the people and I joined the company. I quickly learned that no one else in the company loved podcasting either. In fact, <laughs> we were building a company that was building tools for people who are not us. But the team was so, so impressive and so creative. And that's what was most meaningful. And, and the company really got hit when iTunes launched its podcast directory a while ago. The whole, emphasis, the whole thesis behind Odeo was being a podcast directory so anyone can find podcasts from all over the world very, very simply and very easily. And Apple immediately said that no longer is relevant because we are building it into iTunes. And therefore, people can just go right to their, to their iPods. So during that time, it was a little bit challenging. Um, but I continued to explore some non-programming things. And I got into uh, not just drawing plants, but drawing people. So I took a lot of figure drawing classes. Uh, and I took figure drawing classes because one of my favorite gene designers in the world, Scott Morrison, who created paper denim and cloth and Ernest Stone, and now 3 by one would only hire gene designers who took figure drawing. And I said, well, if I'm going to do something different and this whole audio thing isn't going to work out, I'm going to go into designing genes. And to really do that, I need to understand people and how, to, how they move, how to draw them, how they look. Then I can actually design clothing for them. So I took a bunch of figure drawing in order to eventually roll into the Fashion Design Institute in San Francisco so that I could learn how to make jeans. And I started, and the, the way you start in fashion is not to make pants because they're the hardest thing, but actually you start with skirts. So I made a pencil skirt, I made an asymmetrical skirt, and then I started, we started to learn pants, but then we had this great idea that, we, that I talked about in, in the company of Odeo, and it actually started resonating with the, the folks around me, the folks in the company. And that idea was Twitter. So I dropped out of the fashion school. 
I'm a three-time dropout. I dropped out of University of Missouri Raw, NYU, and this tiny little fashion school. And we created Twitter. And a lot of people see Twitter as this idea that uh, you know these these guys came up with with this this green deer, but it's actually been something that has shown and proven the power of building a platform and building a platform with significant constraint to inspire people to build their own products on top of it. A lot of Twitter's success has been because it stayed and remained consistent. It increased the ease of communication. It increased, in, in, increased the velocity of communication. And people came to it and invented entirely new things, like the at symbol in front of a name, which is a behavior that we didn't think of. It's a behavior we saw and we made easier by programming it into the service. The hashtag, which is a behavior no one in the company thought of, we saw and we made easier. The retweet. Um, so all these, all these systems were not actually created or invented by us, but by the people using the product and using the service on a daily basis. And it was just so inspiring to see people take your work and make it theirs and build something meaningful from it, not just pure products, but actually social constructs as well. And I think that's the true success of what Twitter has done in the world and continues to do in the world. About two and a half years after, after starting Twitter, I took the role of, of chairman. I switched with my co-founder, Ev, who was chairman, became CEO, and I became chairman, and he became CEO. And I reconnected with Jim McKelvey, uh, who was one of my uh, bosses when I was 15 years old at a little company called Mira, which was making CDs. And I reconnected with Jim over the holidays and we really wanted to work together again, but we didn't know on what. Jim suggested that we build an electric car, and this was something I knew nothing about, um, and had a, had a feeling and had the trust that, that people like Elon Musk were going to do something because they just got started, they announced it. There was a lot of attention on the car industry, so we decided that we would keep exploring and keep having conversations. And one day he called me and said, Jack, I want to tell you about something. He called me on his iPhone. And he said, I just lost a sale uh, of this glass art that I, that I make now, because he became a glass artist, and he runs the, the biggest glass factory um, in St. Louis and maybe in North America. And uh, I lost a sale because I couldn't accept a credit card. Do you, think we could make, do you think we could enable me to accept a credit card on my phone? And neither of us had any idea of what that entailed any idea of what that, that would take and what we would have to do. And we also had never worked in finance or anything to do with credit cards or built hardware. So we decided that we would work together. We would take a month and we would answer the question, why can't Jim take a credit card from the device he's carrying around every single day in his pocket, which is his mobile phone? And the answer to that question was the company square. So why do we exist? Why can Square exist in this world, and, and what is it an answer to? It's an answer to this. This is a lot of junk, and this is what people have to deal with just to sell something, just to get into a commerce transaction, and it's just absolutely terrible. You have to put up with so much just running your business and growing your business and starting your business, but to put all this on top of it is ridiculous. So many barriers, so many burdens, and it really slows what people truly want to do in the world. So we decided we would challenge ourselves. We would build an app that someone could download. And then when they download it, they could put in their name and their address. And we would ship them a free reader. They could start swiping cards and have their money in the bank account the very next morning. That was the challenge that we put before ourselves. We built the software. We built, we built the hardware within a month. And then I got to do something I love, which is go around to all my friends and the people I knew, and I started asking for the credit card. And they said, why? And I said, I just want to show you what I'm working on now. And eventually they would hand it over and I would swipe it, and I said, I just took $25 off your card. <laughs> and then I would show a little signature screen, they would sign it with their finger, and they would say, wow, 
Like, how do how do you do that? I want to do that too. And also, where's my twenty five dollars? <laughs> but this was a great company to pitch because I could go out to all of our VCs, and we set up twenty meetings over over two weeks, and uh, to show them the pitch, I said, you know, I can show you this, but it's going to cost. I want to demo the product right right now. So please give me your credit card. And we started with all the VCs that we really didn't want to work with at the beginning of the week and ended with the VCs that we really wanted to work with at the end. And at the start, the price of seeing the pitch was $500. and the end, it was $5. Uh, so I got a lot of money from the VCs I don't really <laughs> like, which was also great. It supplied a lot of great dinners for the team of three people at that point. But we took all of this and we took um, all the damage in the industry, and we made it something that was simple, that was easy, that people could download, and within a minute, actually be a merchant, be able to accept a credit card for whatever they do. It started with people who were piano teachers, but it's moved to people who are running multiple stores around the city. Uh, and it's a truly powerful utility in its simplicity, and also its resonance with what people want to do. And, one of the things that was so, um, so important to us is we saw this gradual shift away from cash, away from checks, and to credit cards, to payment cards. Buyers wanted to use these things everywhere, but no one was able to get in the system. The hardware was way too expensive. Uh, there were so many fees associated with it, and it was just way too complicated for people to understand. So they just stopped, and they put the cash-only signs up, and that meant they also lost sales. So Square Register uh, is something we built not just to simplify that, but also to make sure that a merchant never loses a sale. And that's truly, truly meaningful for their business. We wanted to not just improve the seller side, but also the buyer side. And one of the things that was really important to us is a great buying experience. We're not necessarily sellers in the company. Um, we don't sell things on a, on a daily basis. Jim did. He's an artist, and he sells his glass art. But we didn't. And it's really hard to build, as I, as I saw with Odeo, things for people who are not you. right? So you always want to build something for yourself. You always want to be a little bit selfish and build what you want to see in the world so that you can use it. And we saw this as more from a buying experience. How do we improve the buying experience? How do we make the swipe super fast so it works all the time in the signature? to be really delightful. And one of the things that we loved was after the transaction, getting a receipt. So you enter in your phone number or your email address and you get a receipt. And this receipt was so cool because it could show a map of where the transaction took place. It could show everything that you bought. It could link to that seller's Twitter account or Facebook account or Instagram account so it could actually follow them right from that email receipt. We saw it as a publishing medium as a communication channel between the seller and the buyer. And what could you do with that real estate? No one really has looked at it. And when they have, it's always been kind of in a junky way. But what if that receipt was an application? Could you actually improve the buying experience the next time around? And that's the challenge we put in front of the company, is I want to be able to walk into my favorite coffee store. I want to be able to go up to, a count go up to the counter, order a cappuccino, and then walk out and wonder if I paid or not. It should feel that easy and that frictionless. And the team built it. And it's called Square Wallet. And the way this works is you open up Square Wallet and you link your credit card once. And then you can see all the merchants around you, all the Square merchants around you. And you can actually open up your favorite coffee store, such as Joe's here on campus. And you can flip a switch that says automatically check in hands-free checkout experience. And then I put my phone in my pocket, put my phone in my bag, and I can actually walk up to the counter and I can say, I'd like a cappuccino, and just put it on jack. As soon as I start walking up on the register appears my name and my picture and my most likely order. So it gives the merchant, it gives the seller a tool so they can recognize me as I come in, which enables me um, to feel more like a VIP, more like this is my place and this is a place I'm going to come back to. So right now, today, you can download Square Wallet, link your card, walk up to Joe's, say that you like a cappuccino, put it on Jack, don't put it on me, please. Um, my tab is large enough there. And then take that cappuccino and walk out. And as you walk out, 
it actually sends you a push notification asking if you want a tip, if you just want to leave a tip or not. So without bringing out my wallet, without bringing out my phone, without having to interact with my phone at all, I paid. The credit card moves the money in the background and, and Square Wallet. And the reason we can do this is because this device knows where it is and it knows if it's close to one of our registers. And that opens up the payment intent, which allows us to pay with our presence, with who we are, instead of all these mechanical devices. We continued to dive deeper into what was plaguing a lot of merchants. And a lot of merchants uh, put so much effort and emphasis into the aesthetic of their business, but they have to compromise at the register. They have to put this huge, ugly, honking thing on the counter, and it takes away from the entire experience. And you see how a lot of stores address this. If you go to a luxury store, say you walk into Prada and you order a sweater, you buy a sweater, they don't bring you to the counter and check you out. They take your credit card and then they scurry off to a back room and they charge your card and they come back with uh, a receipt that you need to sign in a leather envelope and you sign that and then they scurry back and they bring out the receipt again in this ridiculous envelope um, that makes the entire thing look great. So they hid uh, the entire experience from you because it's so terrible, because you have to go through so much and they don't want to break the feeling and the experience of everything they've tried to create within their store, right? They don't want to, they don't want to shatter that, that, that dream of, of whatever you have when you walk into that store. And this is also true for a lot of small merchants as well. Um, there's this great New York Times article about six months ago that the number of independent coffee houses in New York City outnumber Dunkin' Donuts and Starbucks combined. Yes. And there's this amazing flight towards quality and locally crafted experiences that people are seeking more and more. And part of this is just because of the experience they can have, the aesthetic, what the merchant is trying to say to the world with their space and, and with their presence. And that's why we wanted to have an answer to all this that you have to put up with on your counter and to actually build something that you felt proud of, something that was beautiful, and something that would look great on your counter and not distract from it, not take away from it at all. And that's why we built Square Stand. So this is a stand that swivels around. It's a very social register, um, fits an iPad, and has a long track reader. So high velocity businesses can process through their lines very, very quickly and get more and more customers and keep all the com customers they do have very happy so they keep coming back for more and more and more. Um, we, uh, we noticed a lot that it wasn't just offline. People didn't just want to sell within their store, but they wanted to sell across the country. Uh, they wanted something that was easy to get to sell e-commerce, to sell online commerce as well. So we made a very, very simple switch for any one of their items. They could go into the register, and they could flip a switch, and suddenly they would have e-commerce. And we call it square market. So you can sell in person, around the block, in the neighborhood, you can flip a switch and suddenly you sell across the nation. Anyone can buy from their phone, anyone can buy from the website, and they ship everywhere. So this has enabled, this just launched about four months ago, and it's really just taken off because people now get to shop at neighborhood stores from across, from across the country. And they want to support more of these stores and more of these locally crafted experiences, and that's exactly what Square Market um, offers into. So now, one of the tools. Cash uh, is a beautiful thing. It is uh, something that a lot of people talk about going away. But the idea is sound. This, this concept of currency, this concept of electricity that transfers between people in the spirit of, of commerce. This is something that's really beautiful and something that's inherently social and something that can be made better through technology. We built a very, very simple technology that I want to share with all of you and you all have access to, as long as you have a columbia.edu email address. How many of you do? Most of you. OK, those of you who do, please take out your phone. I want to introduce you to Square Cash. So what this is, is an ability to send actual money via sending an email. So all you have to do 
right now is bring up your phone and open up your email client. So whatever email client you use, Apple Mail or Gmail or whatever, you can try this. And compose a new mail. And let's say send a dollar to your mother or father. So enter in their email address in the two line. This might be helpful. And then in the CC line, type out cash at square.com. And then the subject line, you can put any amount. You can put here's one dollar. You can just say dollar sign one. In the body, you can put whatever you want. The reason you want to send your parents a dollar right now is because once they receive this, they can also send you money through email. <laughs> right? So the way this works is you're sending an email to this person, and you're CCing Square. Square intercepts that email, and it notices that you don't have a card linked. So it's going to send an email back to you asking you to link your debit card. Once you link your debit card, we can pull that money from your debit card, and we can send that money along. When your parents receive the email from you, they're also going to receive an email immediately from Square saying that you just sent them cash, and we're waiting for you to confirm that. Once you confirm, they receive another email that says, please link your account to get the $1 that your son or daughter just sent you. They enter in their debit card number, and that money is pushed to that card instantly so they can use it right away. And once they have linked their card, then they can send money to you. And when they send money to you, you can use that money instantly as well. It costs 50 cents to send, and it's free to receive, and it works on every single email client. So I hope, uh, I hope you find some use, of, use in it. Anyone you send money to is automatically invited, so they can start sending money as well. But all of columbia.edu has been whitelisted, so any of you can send cash, immediately, immediately link your cards in the hopes of your parents doing the same thing and sending you a bunch of money as well. Is that good? Does it work? <laughs> It'll work, trust me. Um, so one of, the, uh, one of the core concepts that we believe in Square and that has really resonated with me throughout my life is this great quote by Steve McQueen. He didn't say a lot of great things. He said one great thing, and this is, this is pretty much it. Um, but this, to me, is entrepreneurship. This is what it means. When I believe in something, I fight like hell for it. And what that, to mean, what that means to me is when I want to see something in the world and when I want to build something in the world, then I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure it exists. If I have to learn how to program, I'm going to learn how to program. Uh, if I have to learn about the math it takes to draw these maps on the screen, I'm going to do that. That is entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is taking significant risk in order to see something meaningful in the world. It doesn't necessarily mean that you start a company. It just means that you're taking significant risks in order to do something that you want to see in the world, something you want to be in the world. And uh, one of the things that we believe at Square, and, and one, of the thing, one of these realizations of who we're building this for, is we want to build a company of entrepreneurs. Every single person that joins Square is an entrepreneur, because they want to take big risks, and they want to see something meaningful in the world. And we're actually entrepreneurs who are building tools for other entrepreneurs to do the same thing, to build new products in the world, and to build exactly what they want to see in the world. When you do this, when you create a company of entrepreneurs, any idea in the company can have a refounding moment of the company. It can have a moment where it completely shifts the course of the company. And there's a great quote that I think really reflects this well by William Gibson. Does anyone know who William Gibson is? Has anyone read William Gibson? Three people? Four people? Um, William Gibson is a science fiction writer. And he wrote the book Neuromancer. Uh, he coined the term uh, cyberpunk and cyberspace. 
and uh, cypherpunk and all these interesting, interesting little turns of phrases. But he said something really, really cool, which uh, has always resonated with me. It's just amazing to ponder and meditate on, which is the future has already arrived. It's just not evenly distributed yet, which is stunning to think about. The future is already here. It's already with us. And our job is to make sure that we distribute it. So when you're building a company full of entrepreneurs who are building tools for entrepreneurs, the future is actually in every single one of those individual heads that work at Square. And their job is to distribute it to the company to show why it's meaningful, to show why we should change the course of the company or change the course of the product for it. And when that happens, we have a refounding moment in the company. We have something that really rethinks everything that we're doing in spirit of doing something better. And we've done this at least four times in the company where we've really rethought everything that we're doing in order to realize and enrich our products and, and add products like Square Cash, which I just shared with you. Our mission at Square is pretty simple. It's make commerce easy. It's one I'm very, very proud of. Uh, and it's one that really has a lot of meaning in every single one of its words. Every word in this, in this mission tells for us. We are a group of people that loves making things. We don't just love the end product. We love the process. We love the work of getting there. We are craftsmen and we are craftswomen because we love working together and we love working on these things and seeing them in the world. Um, one, of the, one of the amazing works that we, we look at all the time and we're inspired by is the Golden Gate Bridge. A bridge is a very interesting thing because it is a utility that has one job in the world. Its one job is it doesn't fall down. Right? It stays up 100% of the time so that people can get from point A to point B. And the Golden Gate Bridge was interesting because it's a 1.7 mile span built across one of the most tumultuous areas of the West Coast. It's extremely deep. There's earthquakes on the, all the time. It's the last place on the planet that you want to build a bridge. But not only did they have the audacity to build this bridge and to cross that span and to serve its function at staying up 100% of the time, but they also had the audacity to make it beautiful, iconic, something that people talk about, something that people love because they love doing it. And it showed not just in the end product, but also in the building of the bridge. They set out to build a bridge within five years. They built it in three years. They set out to build the bridge in under $50 million of 1934 money. They built it in, with $33 million. It's a stunning feat of engineering and design and architecture, and it still stands beautifully today as it did when it was first created. That's who we aspire to be as a company. That's who we aspire to be as people, that we love our craft, we love our work so much uh, that it stands the test of time. It is truly elegant, it is truly timeless. Commerce is a word that's meaningful to us because a lot of people see Square and they see payments. They see this transactional thing. They see a swipe of a credit card. We decided a long time ago that we didn't want to be a payments company. We don't want to build a business around payments. We want to build a business around commerce. Commerce is the activity between buyers and sellers. It's a conversation. It's something that is social and it's something that is really, really hard to do today uh, and something that is not easy, which is why easy is so important for us. It constantly raises the bar on making it simpler, making it more essential, and making it something that people can get into immediately. All three of these words mean that we're building something that if we do the right job, if we do a great job, we're actually enabling people to focus more on their business, on what they do best. We're enabling buyers to spend less time swiping all these devices and going through all these mechanical things. So in effect, if we're successful, we're actually giving time back to people. We're giving time back to all of our sellers. We're giving time back to all of our buyers. Take all the mechanical things away. Make the technology completely disappear so they can actually focus on what's most meaningful to them. Building their business, crafting their aesthetic, bringing new product to the world and also experiencing whatever they're purchasing, whatever they're buying. That is a meaningful outcome for our mission. That's exactly what we want to do in the world. And it's not just about what we do in the world, it's also what we don't do in the world. One of the things that's been so fundamental to where I've succeeded and, and, and what's been meaningful to me in my life is just focus. 
And the second tool I want to give you all is another interactive one where you have to take out your phone again. So please take out your phone or a notepad. And this is a tool I've been using for a few months. It's very, very simple, but extremely effective in changing patterns in your behavior and changing uh, patterns in your life. And it's a very simple concept, which is do's and don'ts. So open the notepad on your device, the notes app, create a new note, and title it daily. So every day, daily. Go down two lines and type the word do and then colon. And then go down two more lines and type the word don't and then colon. And it's up to all of you to figure out what goes in the do's and don'ts. <laughs> but some examples of this is if you want to exercise more in the do, every day you want to do X number of push-ups or pull-ups or squats or run, whatever it is. And you want to never be late again. You want to, uh, uh, you want to learn, you want to spend 10 minutes a day on learning a new language or 15 minutes learning the guitar or the piano. Um, the do's I found to be really, really easy to write. It's the don'ts that are the hard ones. And the trick that I've learned to fill out the don'ts is to simply recognize when I'm doing something that I don't want to do again, and I add it to this list. So wherever you put this, make it somewhere that you see every single day. You check in the morning, you check midday, you check in the evening, and you just run through mentally everything that you wanted to do every day, and if you actually did it, and everything you want to stop doing, and if you actually stop doing it. Why is this important from a personal level? If I can do this as an individual, then I can do this with my company. If I can do this for me, I can do this for my team. So if I get in the habit of, have of having a very, very strong focus of knowing exactly what I want to do every day, every week, every month, every quarter, every year, and knowing what I'm not going to do in service of what I'm doing, we're going to build a great company. We're going to build something that has massive positive impact in the world, is actually changing uh, in a positive way people's lives. If we can do this individually, then we can do it for everyone. And that's how we think about our company, is in this very, very reflective nature. If we want to see financial transparency, if we want to see transparency in the financial world, we, Square, need to be transparent as a company. We need to do whatever it takes to build our company around the concept of transparency. In order to build a company around transparency, we also have to be transparent as individuals, frank, direct, uh, and really to the point in service of our mission and what we want to see in the world. Okay? So will you all try this for at least a week? Will you also send your parents cash? Okay, well, that's all I have to say, and I think we're going to get to some questions now. First of all, thank you, Jack. It's truly incredible to hear your story and the story of how Square has revolutionized commerce and built a culture that motivates folks to be entrepreneurs and leaders. Core strongly believes that entrepreneurship is a mindset and a reflex that must be practiced, and your presence today goes a long way to inspiring us all to action. I'm Kevin Tseng, and I'm lucky enough to serve the most amazing student team as president of Core. We want to reiterate our thanks to CEO, CCE, CAA, Columbia Entrepreneurship, and all the partners and supporters who've made this opportunity possible for everyone here. We're going to move on next to the question and answer session. Before I introduce that, though, I wanted to highlight the Founders Trade Show, a selection of nine fantastic startups run by Columbia students or alumni. They're tabling all night just near the ramps through the doors to your left. Please do check them out after the Q&A session. Uh, these are incredible Columbia entrepreneurs who strongly deserve your interest and support, so please check it out. I had prepared some heartwarming and personal anecdotes about James J. Valentini, Dean of the College and Vice President for Undergraduate Education, who is slated to moderate the Q&A session tonight. Unfortunately, Dean Valentini had a non-life-threatening health issue early today, and he had to pull out of the event. Uh, we want to wish him well, and we look forward to seeing him support more entrepreneurship events in the future. 
In his place, Dean Boyce has graciously agreed to moderate the question and answer session. If you're interested in asking a question, we do have mics in the front of the aisles, and so we just ask that you carefully, not rushing, queue up in front of a mic, um, and we'd be happy to take your questions. Without further ado then, please welcome back Dean of Engineering and Morris A. and Alma Shapiro Professor, Mary C. Boyce. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you, Core, for arranging such an amazing night. Uh, so, Jack, I'll be asking you a few questions, and then we'll invite questions from the audience. So I would invite the audience uh, to begin to line up um, behind the mics while I start the questioning so that we're, we're all set when that time comes. So I want to start off by um, first uh, asking about your tortuous path. So we heard of this amaz amazing <clears throat> tortuous path to, to what finally led you to, uh, say, Twitter, and where you really uh, explored many different careers um, and each had seemed to also have an entrepreneurial uh, component that was possible. Um, yet, it, I also took away that you had this dispatch thing in the back of your mind uh, as part of this. So, I, I want to relate that back to your um, one of your favorite quotes uh, when you said, "When I believe in something, I fight like hell for it." A, a Steve McQueen quote. And uh, what was it that you really? believed in? Was it the dispatching? Was it the, the passion to be an entrepreneur? What, what really was your driving force? Well, what, what I love about that quote and what I think every entrepreneur is doing is they're being very, very selfish. They're building what they want to see in the world and they're making the bet with the world that it resonates with other people. And sometimes we win the bet and sometimes we lose the bet. In my own case, I wanted to see the world. I wanted to see everything that was happening. I wanted to see it in the screen in front of me. I wanted to be able to see what was happening at the Met right now, why everyone was swarming up there, what was going on. Um, and the reason why was first I was just fascinated by how things work. And, uh, and I could never understand how a city like this works. You know, it's just so many people, so much infrastructure, um, yet it hums and buzzes along and it does so in, in relative order. How, how, does that, how does that work? And just satisfying my own curiosity was one of those things. But also, as we, as we developed Twitter and as we, as we started learning more and more about it, um, and, and also Dispatch, you start learning that if people start sharing very simple things about what's going on in their life, um, sharing simple moments, it really makes the world feel very, very small. And one of the effects of building my maps and seeing everything that was happening in New York was New York felt very small to me. It felt something that I could, I could approach, something I could interact with, something I could, I could feel really great about. And as I've watched Twitter grow and I've, I've seen people use Twitter all over the world, um, you see the same thing. You see this, uh, this shrinking of the, of the world. You know, before the Iran election, Iran very much was a black box to me. I did not understand what was going on in the country. I did not understand how people on the ground uh, saw it and interacted with it. But suddenly, during, the, during those election protests, people were taking pictures, and they were sending tweets and, and, uh, and sending videos. And suddenly, I had people on the ground who were sharing their experience. And suddenly, I saw Iran in a completely different light. And it made, again, the world feel very, very small. So all of this, to me, serves towards, a, towards a, a destination, towards an end of if we can encourage people to share just the smallest details of, of what's going on in their life and, and just talk about more things, we have a deeper understanding for how everyone wakes up, how everyone goes to sleep, what struggles they have to go throughout, throughout their day. And if we have understanding, we have the capacity to build up empathy. And if we have empathy, we can minimize conflict. And I truly believe that if we have enough people really focused on this and, and really seeing everything that's happening in the world, we can minimize conflict in the world. Um, and, and that, to me, is, it would be an end goal of, of a system like Twitter is to, is to show what is happening in the world in order to lift understanding and, and lift empathy. So when students are really um, trying to pursue their passion through entrepreneurship, 
the, I mean, you don't always know how big that moment is going to be when it happens. And what, what can we be doing here, you know, at a university to, to encourage that sort of simultaneous pursuit while they're having their other, other um, obligations as a student, but we still want to enable that passion and, and that exploration. Um, encourage them to join Square as an intern. <laughs> no, but I mean, in, intern, internships are, are, are stunning in terms of the amount of learning uh, that you can do in a very, very short time frame. Um, and when you're, when you're in school, like, it's just such a great tool uh, to, to see a very, very different perspective about running and, and learning um, things. So we learn so much from our interns, and, and we treat all of our interns as we would any other square. And we've had interns who've completely rewritten parts of our stack and, and really you know, changed our thinking in a lot of ways. Um, but if you, want to, uh, if you want to have an entrepreneurial mindset, then go work alongside other entrepreneurs that you respect and that you think you'll, you'll learn from. And uh, you know, there's, there's a lot out there, and we have, we have a company full of them. So it's a, it's a great option, but mm -hmm. definitely encourage it. So I, I think this is a great point, that the life and work experience all add up uh, or are valuable on the path to an entrepreneurship, and it's, yeah. it's, it's not an easy path either. Nope, nope. Um, and it, it, takes a, it takes a lot of creativity, invention, and, and then just patience and, and follow through. Okay. Do you feel there was um, many lessons learned from Twitter that made the square a faster path? Um, Absolutely. Um, one of the things we did very, very poorly in the early days of Twitter is we had no idea what was happening with the system. So we had the system going down all the time because we had no instrumentation about uh, you know, this particular procedure and, and program was just using way too much memory or consuming too, more, too many resources. So everyone would speculate. And we got into this issue where people started speculating about what was happening instead of knowing what was happening because we didn't have any instruments on how the plane was flying. And imagine flying a plane without any instruments at all. Imagine flying a plane without knowing or driving a car without knowing how fast you're going, right? It's scary and you crash into things uh, because you don't, have, you don't have a relation of what else is happening in, in contrast to you. You don't have the, the sense of momentum. So the one thing that we did to fix that was we started doing this thing of pair programming. And we got two programmers down to one computer. One person would have their hands on the keyboard and they would actually verbalize the problem and, and verbalize the issue that they were trying to solve. And what this did is it spread the knowledge of the entire system and what was going well and what, was, what needed to be fixed throughout the entire company because everyone would hear it all day long. We were you know, seven people. Mm -hmm. And we started building all this instrumentation. And one of the things that really came out of that for me is like, wow, we were really poor at communication in the early days of Twitter, like really, really poor. The, uh, you know, our engineering staff would not talk to our operations staff. They would just throw tickets over the fence and they would just hate each other. And yet, we were building a communications company <laughs> and we couldn't communicate internally. Mm -hmm. So what I learned from that and, and what we've done at Square is number one, the first line of code I wrote was an admin dashboard to show instrumentation, show everything that's happening within the system and within the company so there's no speculation and there's no guessing, someone can just point and show that this is broken and here's how we need to fix it, right? And the second is really building a company that's reflective of the product. So we, you know, as much time we spend engineering and designing the product, we also spend engineering and designing the company and, and, and ideally how we all work together. If you have two people who don't get along, who fight all the time, who can't agree on a direction, it will manifest in the product. It will. Like if the wallet team doesn't get along with the register team, it's going to manifest in the product. And that means we're putting our issues and all of our failures in front of our customers. And that's just rude and selfish. And we don't want to be rude or selfish. So we have to design and engineer the, the organization and the structure in order to build a great product. So we spend a lot more time focusing on, on building a great company in order to build a great product. And, and that goes back to that that make of our mission, which is we want to be craftsmen. We want to be craftsmen. We want to really focus not just on the end product, 
but also the work to get there and, and be really proud of that work to get there. Um, I have two questions that um, come from, from students or, and uh, alumni and, and lecturers. So uh, first, uh, a question by uh, Donnell Baird, a second year Columbia Business School student who I believe is here tonight, if Donnell is here. Both Twitter and Square created new markets meaning that customers were not sending each other group SMS size correspondence or using smartphones to transact credit card purchases at scale prior to Twitter and Square. Columbia guest lecturer Steve Blank, one of the most influential thinkers on the topic of entrepreneurship today, recommends that entrepreneurs creating new markets should for allow for three or four years of lag time before customers catch up and the company starts gaining traction. What have you learned and what advice do you have for entrepreneurs who are navigating the process of customer education when starting a new market? Um, well, I mean, the, the, biggest, uh, the biggest way to educate people is to show them what's possible and to, and to show them something that works. They can actually feel and use in their hands today. And uh, we put a lot of emphasis when we were starting with Square that we're not going to go out to the world, and especially to VCs, and tell people we have designs on building this thing that enables you to accept credit cards from your mobile phone. We're going to show them by taking their credit cards and charging them. And, and that will resonate. That will resonate in a, in a wow. Like, mm -hmm. how'd you do that? And I want that. So I found that you know, there wasn't as much um, time to, to learn and to educate as, as we really needed, because it really struck a nerve in the market. This is something that people wanted to participate in. They were locked out. Uh, before, because of all the complexity and the cost, and and just the uh, just the, the you know the, the ridiculousness of what they have to go through just to start accepting credit cards, um, so so that was actually quite fast and it just resonated immediately. Mm -hmm. What didn't was the industry's take on it, the industry uh, educating the financial industry of why this was important. And again, we took that that concept of show don't tell to them as well. And we went to Visa, and we had them take out their Visa cards, and we swiped their cards, and we showed them that, hey, check your statement. Money is now off. And wouldn't this be great if you could now reach the 26 million small businesses across the United States that don't accept Visa cards? And they said, yeah, that would be pretty great, and let's figure out how to work together. So, so for us, it wasn't um, as much of a customer problem as it was an industry problem, and really teaching the industry to rethink itself a bit. Um, so that more people could participate and they could they could do it much faster, uh, and uh, eventually you know eventually that worked out. It, it did take some time, but if you have patience and you have conviction about this should exist in the world, it does resonate with the right people. People do want to see more of it, and we want to build it. Patience patience always wins. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay. Why don't we start with the questions from the audience? Hi, my name is Yang, and I study at Columbia Journal School. So recently, through Columbia Journal School's career website, I learned that Twitter is actually uh, trying to hire head of media partnership uh, across different countries and regions. Uh, so I apply. Uh, you could be my future boss, but may the best candidate win. Um, <laughs> but my question is really, uh, how are you going to penetrate into China when Twitter is really banned there, and then recently, uh, I think China's highest court has, you know, issued some sort of uh, judicial guidelines, um, sort of like discouraging people to retweet or repost or comment online. So, that's basically my question. Thank you. Yeah, it's not it's not just a, a question for Twitter, but um, the technology industry at large um, is really, and, and and also businesses in the U.S. at large, just really how to interact with China. Um, it's something we're also looking at, at at Square, and just as we look at broadening um, what, what we've done very well in the United States and Japan and Canada and going around the world. Um, there's not going to be one clear answer uh, to this. And a lot of it has to do with the people um, in China demanding that you know, services like these that, that we're building, uh, they can use them. Um, and, and some of that's just like speaking up to the government. And I think you're seeing a lot of that. You're seeing a lot of people right, right around the firewall and. You know, I think free and simple and easy communication always finds a way, and it will always find a way, and there will always be people who punch through the firewall and, and, and get their message out. And to me, that just shows, you know, 
what the future holds. Can we take a question over here? Hi, uh, my name is Rosmi. I'm a first year student, so this is my third week of school, and I'm learning a lot, and everything is amazing. Um, and I'm working hard, and it takes up all my time, but everything is good. But I'm also, I'm also a programmer, and I like to create things, and I like to code a lot. And there's, there's this struggle arising between time spent on the things you must do, like homework, problem sets, and the things you want to do, like create you know, applications and so on. And you describe yourself as a three-time dropout. And my question is not necessarily, <laughs> it's, my question is not, would you recommend dropping out so much as it is, how did you make that decision on you know, staying in school versus pursuing your dreams? Well, I think uh, everyone learns in a different way. And for me, I was learning faster and what I thought to be better outside of school than I was inside of school. And it was an easy decision for me until I had to make the call to my mother and tell her that I was dropping out of school again. And uh, you know, she still talks to me about, you know, Jack, maybe it's time that you go back <laughs> and you finish, you finish what you started. And I said, Mom, like, just don't have the time right now, but maybe in the future I will. Um, so for me, it was, it was a very easy decision because I was just learning so much and being able to build so much outside of school. And I think for a lot of people I know, um, it's a very different situation. They're learning more inside of school. They took internships. They, they tried uh, to build something. Um, they tried to build applications. And they were just learning uh, richer and, and faster within school. So it's really a case-by-case -case basis. And you really have to follow your gut. You, know, you, you have to you know, see what your intuition is saying. Is, is this the right choice for me, or, or is this? And I, I think schools like Columbia help um, with that, because a lot of the programming and computer sciences, science courses I'm seeing um, all over the country are encouraging people to be entrepreneurial, encouraging people to get small teams together and actually building applications uh, and trying it out within the, the boundaries of, of the school program, which I think is great support and pushes you in a way that a lot of people need to be, need to be pushed. For me, um, being, being pushed outside was just more, more meaningful, but it's definitely not for everyone. Okay, thank you. My name is Philip. Uh, Jack, you talked a lot about creativity and uh, kind of reinvention and uh, having contributions from interns, et cetera. But uh, uh, at the same time, I think both Twitter and Square have been incredibly disciplined companies uh, in terms of uh, their pro product roadmaps. I'm sure you've kind of played around with video and photos at Twitter. I'm happy it looks back, like that on the outside. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps uh, back uh, 2006, 2007 when you first got started, but you know that wasn't pushed out and it wasn't something that um, uh, kind of percolated through the pipeline um, and was released uh, right away. And um, uh, kind of, uh, I was wondering how you think about kind of product releases and how, uh, when when it is to, okay to experiment and let all flowers bloom, um, maybe kind of Gmail style and 20 percent, um, and when it is uh, important to pull back and push things even as much as uh, years away. Yeah, I mean the the simplest thing I found is is you know, being a little bit selfish and, and building what I want to see in the world and talking about it and bringing that idea and showing that idea to other people. And if it resonates, great, you continue to build it. And if it doesn't, you put it on the shelf and maybe it comes back as another product or another idea or um, another, another movement that you, have, that you have down the line. But um, I've found that like, if, if you do that, um, you can actually prove the resonance with numbers. So I think a lot of companies operate and we're going to build what we want to build and what we think the market wants to see. And then there's other companies that do all experiments and are doing a lot of A-B testing and, and building you know, reactively to how these experiments pan out. And I believe that life is always found in the balance. And right in the center of those two extremes of going to intuition and and going to test is, is where I like to build, which is we're going to follow our intuition. We're going to build what we want to see in the world and what we want to use on a daily basis in the world. And then we're going to prove it with data. We're going to show that it works and that it resonates with other people and they want to see the same thing. Um, and that's always been a very simple and easy way to, uh, to think about like how we release a product. You know, you know when it's ready. You want, to put yourself, you want to put yourself under a constraint of, 
of time to try to get it, you know, try to get it out on a normal schedule and to try to have that discipline in practice. But you're not going to ship things that you're not proud of. You're not going to ship things that you don't want the world to see and you don't want the world to use. So, uh, you know, follow your gut and then also prove it that it was actually the right choice with the data and how people use it. Okay. We have many more questions, but we'll only be able to take one final one. So, please. Hi, I'm David. I got my I got my BS in mechanical engineering here in 2010, but now I'm working as a software engineer. Um, my question is, uh, what is your take on cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin or Litecoin, and do you ever see Square engaging with those types of financial instruments? And also, what is your favorite map projection? Map injection? Map projection. Map projection. <laughs> um. <laughs> I don't know. You can answer uh, one or two of this guy. <laughs> yeah, I mean all of them. Um, in terms of uh, cryptocurrencies, so uh, Bitcoin I think is a very, very fascinating idea. I, I think eventually there will be an alternative form of payment like that that allows for anonymous payments that is free, um, that feels like cash, but is also secure and points back to the buyer and the seller. Um, I don't know if Bitcoin is the best expression of that just yet but it's certainly a, a good one. I think um, at Square, we've always focused on this philosophy of we're going to accept whatever form of payment comes across the counter, because that means the seller is always able to make the sale and always able to grow their business then. And that means the buyer can always purchase what they want. So I don't imagine a world where cash completely disappears or credit cards go away or Bitcoin completely takes over and we have one form of currency. I think we'll always have many. And I think the most important thing for us as a commerce company, not a payments company, is to make sure we can always facilitate that. And we can give data back to the seller so that they can make decisions around how to build their business. And we can great, give a great experience to the buyer so they keep coming back to those, to those sellers. So to us, it's not really about the payment at all or the device or the currency, because that's just one tiny little part of the entire continuum of, of commerce. And, and that's what we're focused on, that's why we're so excited about that canvas because it's so large. You know, it's as large as communication, but it's become more complicated, more heavy, more abstract, and more costly, whereas communication always becomes more frictionless, more free, and more, more easy. So our mission is to make commerce as easy as communication, as free as communication, and really, uh, really build a, a company and a business around commerce instead of just payments. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, let's thank Jack again, and then we'll hear from Alex. Thank you. Okay. So, so let me introduce Alex, who's the uh, president of the CEO. So please. Give me a minute, everyone. I'll, uh, I'll get you out of here quickly. Uh, thank you very much, Dean Boyce. Thank you, Jack, for uh, coming and sharing your vision. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard you're interested in, in being the mayor of New York one day, maybe. We can help out, hopefully. Um, why are we even here? We're here to hear, hear Jack, but that's, it's more than that. Jack's here because he's creating something amazing in the world and simplifying interactions that we all have on a daily basis. And I think we're all here because at Columbia, something's happening. Um, I know I feel it. I think a lot of us are excited to be here. We feel the amazement of seeing someone who's doing such amazing things. but. That excitement is actually more than just tonight. It's not something ephemeral, and I don't want you to, to leave mistaking this feeling for something that's just about one night. There's a movement coalescing here in New York and here at Columbia University, an entrepreneurial spirit, a spirit of let's build something better. Um, we can see it in, in the interaction between the groups at the undergraduate level, in the engineering school, CEO, we can see it in this event tonight, we can see it in the entrepreneurship festival that we're going to be having at the end of the year, it's the, the first ever of the university, uh, CEO and core and some other groups are putting that on. Um, I get to see it as part of the dorm room fund, which is a student run VC, uh, we invest only in student startups. There are three people from Columbia, uh, the university on it, and we've invested in actually five companies that are related to Columbia. Some of them are still current students. Some of them are, are recent graduates. 
The point is that something really is happening here, something powerful, and it's you guys here in the audience, students and alumni who are supporting the students that are making that happen. You're actually seeing something that you want to do and you're taking a risk to build something into the world. Just don't leave tonight thinking it's just one night, an exciting speaker coming. It is. But what's happening here at the university is more than that. Um, and we're really lucky tonight because we also have nine examples of people who are doing that really, really well and really exemplify that spirit. And they're right outside, out those doors at our trade show. Nine companies from current and recent students who are building something amazing. Um, and so, as I let you go, I just want you guys to remember and take a moment and realize that, again, this, what's happening here in, in this campus and the city tonight, it's all part of one thread. And I think you guys should go out, check out the companies out there, see how they're continuing to pull that thread. And then as you leave, I think you should do it as well. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Jack and, and Dean Boyce.